evening, everyone. Um, we're back here in the uh, AM radio technician class tonight. And I'm going to uh, begin in a moment by sharing the, uh, the book. I'm going to uh, go right into that and we're going to get started. All righty. Am I in the right book? I believe I am. Am radio license manual. Well, let me see. I am in the right book. Very cool. Okay. Last night we started into electricity, but I uh, I don't remember if we got to this page or not. I think we did. I think. I left it off right where I wanted to pick up. And uh, um, I believe I covered with you Ohm's Law and the power formula. E equals IR and P is equal to IE. And I stumbled upon by accident, but had a chance to show you how easy it is to overlook that you need sometimes both formulas to calculate out what you want. So, um, I'll get back to, where was it? Well, I lost the drive. All right, I want to start right here on, uh, come on, there we go. This is figure 3.6, and it is a, uh, uh, good evening, uh, Kyle, AJ, and Jason are with us. We haven't missed anything yet, guys. This be is, uh, ex this drawing is, or uh, this little image, uh, is an attempt to explain um, measurements for those for those formulas and uh, in this case you have a battery as the power supply you have a resistor which is the load now a load could be an actual resistor a resistor converts electricity in the heat or it could be a uh, um, it could be a light bulb it could be a radio it could be any device but for the purposes of calculations in pure DC circuits, it's going to change a little when we get to AC circuits. In pure DC circuits, you can consider any load a resistor for calculations. Now, the point of this exercise is that, you know what? Is this hard for you guys to see on the screen? Tell you what, indulge me for a moment. I'm going to grab this. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop this share for a minute. I'm going to open up the, um, I'm going to open up a uh, paint program as I often do. This will take just one second. And I'm going to put this in to it so that I can blow it up and we can see it much larger. Okay. All right, I'm going to share that. Here we go. I think you see this paint program. And with the magic of, uh, of uh, computer science, I can make it a lot bigger on the screen, a little blurrier, but uh, that part won't be so bad. All right, so what we have in this particular instance is a 10 ohm resistor, a six ohm resistor, and I don't know resistor. And it wants us to calculate, in the first case, it's, it, it, uh, we, have, we know the value of the resistor, but we don't know the voltage of the ba battery. 
But we know two amps is going through it. All right. Well, I will cheat a little bit here on this page. I will open up. You won't be able to see it. I'm sorry, but I will make it possible to see in a minute. Um, now, I think we can work with this just the way it is. I, I don't think we need the circles, do we, guys? If we walk through the equation. So if E is equal to IR and we know the uh, current I is 2 amps and we know the resistance is 10 ohms, these are in whole units, ohms, amps, we need to know what the voltage is in volts. Well, 2 times 10 must be 20 volts. Now, you got in the second equation, we know we got a 12 volt battery. We got a six ohm resistor, but we don't know how much current is on this scale. By the way, if you go by this, it's two amps because they push this, position them all in the same spot. But don't count on that being right. I think I would have made them look differently, but anyways. It happens to be that E over R, because if we look at that circle of E, I, R, E is over R, and that will give us I. So if we divide 12 volts by 6, we get 2 amps. Now, they made this one look like 2 amps, too, but this time they're fooling you. Aren't they? No, they're not. They're showing you a six volt battery. And they're showing you that there's two amps being used. They want to know how many ohms is that resistor. Well, E over I is equal to R. So six divided by two is three ohms. That's how simply you use that equation. If this were a watt meter and the measurement were in amps and we were it was and and in uh, volts and amps and it was asking you how many watts is right here we would use the p i e formula power is equal to e i e so power is always equal to e times i so if we want to know how many watts this 10 ohm resistor is cranking out on the first equation, well, we know we got 20 volts. We got two amps. That's a 40 watt load. And that 40 watt load would be a pretty big resistor. We look at this 12 volt circuit. We've got 12 volts. We calculate it out at two amps. That's a 24 watt load. And in the last version, we got six at two amps is a 12 watt load. Not in the particular example, but it's easy to follow through when you look at this. Um, I'm going to now go back to the book. So I will go to, gosh darn it. There it is, stop share. All right, so now I'm gonna share screen, go back to the book. So in the book, we had that same equation. That's not it. Hang on, share screen, paint, here we go. That book, we have the same equation, the same drawing, same chart, same equations. You get a feel for how to use them very simply. Oh, let's, and by the way, that's all these questions that were just uh, right there. They're based on the same sort of thing. Now we're going to get the rest of what I walked through you. The, the, the part about the power is right here. Uh, they've changed values, but it's the same sort of thing. All right, in 3.2, they cover component units. By the way, don't get excited, guys. We'll be covering this over again in the future. We're going to go through questions and answers on Monday. 
and some will include some of these, and we will work them through. Components in, uh, and units. And I really think you got to pay attention. There is a chart they put somewhere disproportionately in your book. All right, it's not here. I think I went through this last time, and I told you guys I'd find it for you. I'll give it to you a break time. I've got, yeah, I've got it. Hang on. Tell you what, guys, I'm going to share something with you. I'm going to share that with you in a minute. But so let's uh, stop this share. I'm going to go to get a drawing. Oh, it's here it is. All right. And now I can share this with you. Share screen. This uh, is um, the metric uh, uh, conversion or, or units chart. Um, this one's based in meters, but it doesn't matter whether you're talking meters, uh, megawatts, um, uh, picofarads, whatever the unit is, these are the prefixes. So in ham radio, you, we will use kilo, mega, and giga the most. A kilo of anything is a thousand. So that's why when you buy a kilo of, of hash and end up in federal prison, it's a thousand grams of hash. That's what they're talking about. It's a kilogram. If you go a kilo mile, it's a th or I'm sorry, a kilometer, it's a thousand meters. If you buy a megaliter of fuel, you bought yourself a tank of a million gallons of fuel. You got more money than I do. Giga is a billion. On the flip side, we will also use some smaller measurements. We'll use milli, which is one one hundredth. You'll we'll use uh I'm sorry, one one thousandth of milli. We'll use micro, which is um uh a thousandth of a millimeter or a thousandth of a milli, we'll use nano, nano, and pico. And there are components that have very small measurements like that in electronics. Um, they're pretty easy to remember. Just starting with the electronic ones are always by three. Uh, you start with uh, 10 to the minus three, uh, micro being 10 to the minus six, nano being 10 to the minus nine, 10 to the minus 12. So basically it's one over and you keep adding three zeros as you move down. You will find this chart or a similar chart in your book, not this exact one. You can find these all over the internet. If you're familiar with unit bases and unit uh, conversions, this won't be a problem. Um, well, uh, other sciences and measurements and things like, you know, architecture and, and uh, land measurements are um, use the other units, okay, the other values. We, uh, we only need uh, concern ourselves with the uh, five I pointed out to you, pico, nano, micro, and milli. That's four of them, Nick. And there's three more, seven I pointed out to you. Giga, mega, and kilo. So if you got a thousand hertz, it's a kilohertz. If you got a million hertz, it's a megahertz. Yeah, if you step on a tack, that's a megahertz too, but that's another story. So if you're operating at a thousand kilohertz, you're at one megahertz. 
if you're operating at um, uh, three megahertz, you're at 3,000 kilohertz. Likewise, uh, if you play with the numbers, millicente and everything, uh, you won't need centi, but milli, micro, nano, and pico. They get a little confusing. I'm going to tell you that capacitors and inductors are usually in uh, micro, nano, and pico. They didn't used to use pat, uh, pico and nano. They used to use micro, micro. Got very confusing. So nowadays it's easier to understand. So if you see something that says um, it's a uh, one picofarad, well, then you've got hundreds, a million, right here is a million, billion, and you've got a trillion a trillionth of a ferret. Seems small. The reason they're tiny is I got to give you a clue. A ferret capacitor, if I'm not mistaken, physically ends up being like the size of uh, two garbage cans wide and two garbage cans high. And it wouldn't fit in your little tiny uh, handheld radio. What's more, when we start working with these things, it'll become obvious that you have to have real tiny values for some of these things. All right, so I'm gonna go back to the book and we'll start sharing back to the book. Okay. Now, we're gonna take a break, break in a minute, but I wanted to uh, cover something back here. Oh, I was right there. I told you to, I think I told you to get familiar with the chart of symbols. And in the back of the of your of this chapter, there's a chart of electronic symbols. Did I not tell you guys to look at that? Okay. Now we're gonna go through and see what's really there. These are resistors. They're not all the resistors possible. But I'm going to tell you about them so you understand. These are co common carbon or film resistors. They're standard small value in terms of current resistors. They're usually uh, the smallest of them will be like an eighth of a watt, meaning they can handle an eighth of a watt. The larger ones might be uh, might be able to handle a half or a quarter of a watt. The other larger ones are uh, power resistors. A resistor like this one, or even this one, is very likely a pure resistor. In DC circuits, it doesn't matter. But in AC circuits, resistors like this one and this one are made from coils of wire. And because of that, they are not pure resistors. In AC um, circuits, they have an inductive component. And we're gonna talk about that after the break. So they're not pure resistors. And we can't always use them interchangeably, and I'll explain that. This one in the middle is a form of a variable resistor. It's so wire resistor, when you move this back and forth, you change the difference of resistance between these three points. Now, there's also capacitors in here. Again, capacitors have varying types of capacitors. These two right here are uh, electrolytic capacitors. Electrolytic capacitors are DC only capacitors. Uh, this one here is probably electrolytic. You can't really see the, let's see if I can enlarge it. Can't really see it, but one of these is probably marked as a positive, but I can't be certain. This little one right here is an electrolytic. It's just a surface model electrolytic. 
Electric -letic, electrolytic capacitors are generally used for filtering. These round ones here are uh, not that one, this one, this one, and these here are a type of film, thin film capacitors. They usually can support AC and DC. Well, not this one. I apologize. This one, this one, this one, this one. These two, I believe, I know for sure that one, I believe this one too. It's hard to tell from the picture. These are a type of special capacitors called tantalums. They are electrolytic, but they have the unique quality that they can be, they have been pretty much designed miniaturized for the wallop they can hold. Now, we're gonna understand the difference as we go through the class, and we're gonna learn the differences of why they matter. Okay, now, these right here are inductors, and inductors are coils. They are literally just coils, just like this. These are air wound coils. This, this coil is round, wound around a ferrite core. A ferrite core allows for intensifying magnetic fields. And inductors in AC circuits we utilize to take advantage of their magnetic fields. This one is called a toroid inductor. There's a round donut shaped or toroid iron core. And uh, it allows for a convenient way to accurately make an inter, uh, a, uh, inductor of values that we can calculate by the number of winds very easily. This is what we used to call a slug inductor. It's a form of variable inductor. It's not the only form. And uh, uh, it's so that you that you can what in this particular case, as you move the iron core in the middle up and down between the windings of the coils, you change the inductance. We use these for tuning circuits, like fine tuning your radio. Now, we get into some fancy stuff. These are very, all variable resistors. This one has a little screw here to adjust, usually circuit mounted on a board. This has a little screwdriver slot to adjust, a little tiny screw there to adjust, same with this. These two commonly are, what on, the, are on the other side of a volume control. Uh, variable resistors, like all resistors come rated in various wattages, how much current or how much power they can dissipate. And they also come as either linear or logarithmic tapped. If it's linear, when you turn the knob, as the turn increases, the voltage remains or, or, or I shouldn't say the voltage, the resistance increases proportionate to the turn. So if you turn it um, halfway, you're at the halfway point. If you turn it all the way, you're, at, of course, at the all the way, the maximum resistance. A, there is one other type not shown here, and that's multi-turn resistors. There are resistors where you can turn this turn like 10 turns to get to the maximum. Now, if they're not linear and they're logarithmic, when you tune up, if you tune up halfway, you're going to probably tune up about 3 dB or and double the resistance. Those are generally for audio circuits. Below are variable are forms of variable capacitors. And again, as you turn the tu tuning knob or the little screw thing, the uh, larger ones are what we usually use for uh, uh, tuning capacitors for like uh, 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 frequency tuning on a radio. Adjustment tunings for calibrating our small um, 
uh, pot type capacitors like these with a little turn tuning screw. When you loosen that screw, the two plates separate, reducing the capacitance. When you bring them close together, the capacitance increases. We're going to go back to the book. And there it is. And we're going to talk about the difference between DC circuits and AC circuits and the two principal differences, reactance and impedance. To begin with, uh, I'm going to share a picture to you. And it's a little fancy drawing here. And in this drawing, we have a battery. And we have a capacitor. We have a resistor. And we have a coil or an inductor and a light bulb. And if we turn this battery, or if we have this battery connected as it is, a plus charge of voltage, and I'm going to uh, reduce this and grab a, oh, I guess a paintbrush will work. And how about a pretty color? The voltage, uh, that's not what I wanted. Let's, uh, that's not going to work at all. So let's undo that because you won't be able to see it. All right. I want to pick something that will let me do it in a reduced uh, image. There we go. There we go. Opacity about 10%. So uh, that'll work. I just need a bigger thickness. Here we go. So as the electrons are flowing and they reach this point, they're all built up on this part of this of the capacitor. And they will charge that capacitor fully up. And there they stop. Can't do a thing with it. Why? Because there's no place for those things to go. Capacitor is in a pure DC circuit. In series, it is an open switch. But if instead of putting this capacitor here, I take this capacitor and put it here, something really cool happens. When the electrons flow here, well, actually, they flow on this side, but it doesn't matter. When the charge builds positive here, a negative charge. Let's get a drawing. There we go. A negative charge builds up on this side. Uh, we don't want to happen that to happen too fast. We could put a resistor in here, and it would slow this down. But I'm going to put the resistor in this case after the fact, and I'll explain why. If we now hook this circuit up, just like this, at first, nothing will turn on till this capacitor charges up. However long it takes to charge that capacitor, without a resistor in here, it might only be a matter of microseconds. But if we had another resistor, this one, and I copy it, and I paste it in here. Where did it go? Here we go. If I had a resistor in here, and... This might not be the pr prettiest drawing, but it will work for us. And uh, now I 
of the circuit. This resistor is going to limit how fast this capacitor can charge. So what's going to happen is, just like I started to present for you before, I think that's the color I used. It's going to get through this resistor. It's going to slow things down. And eventually, I'm trying to illustrate that it will get more and more charged on each side. And when it's charged enough to get through this resistor, well, on its way through this, a slight magnetic field will build up. And then the light bulb will illuminate. This is the basics of basics of basic electrical timing circuits. Why is that important in radio? Because frequency is a function of time. And the way we make frequencies is by adjusting a timing. Now, the reason this happens is instantly when this power is turned on, current flows through this circuit. That's the moving of electrons. But charge doesn't build up until both sides are fully charged. One side positive, one side negative. So what happens is the voltage lags behind the current. An interesting thing happens the opposite way in a coil. In a coil, when the voltage comes, it shoots right across instantly. But as a magnetic field builds in the coil, the current is being blocked. Remember, a flow of electrons always requires a magnetic field that it generates. And that generation of the of magnetic field opposes the motion of or the flow of electrons until that field is fully formed. In a straight wire, it's instant. But in a coil, it becomes delayed. In a inductor, the voltage leads the current. In a capacitor, the, capa the current leads the voltage. In other words, voltage in a capacitor instantaneously is being held, but the current is instantaneously moving. That's why the charges build up. When the charges build up fully to fully charge the capacitor, then it, flows, it can flow outward quite well. An inductor, though, is the opposite story. An inductor, magnetic field opposes the current, but the voltage is present right away. It's, the voltage is right here, right away. The current doesn't flow right away. These two limiting resistors act to slow the rate that the magnetic field builds or the rate that the capacitive field builds, or the charge field builds. So they are basically timing resistors. But once they fully charge in a DC circuit, which isn't very long, our cute little light bulb lights up. Not bad drawing for me. We call these phenomena, or this phenomena, this delay, we call this reactance. It's how a magnetic field, or in the case of a capacitor, what is really a static field, react in an electrical circuit. We call it reactance. We have a formula for it. I'll go through it in a minute. OK? The combination of reactants, whether it's capacitive reactants or inductive reactants, together with resistance, we call impedance. Impedance is pure opposition 
to current or voltage. It's a opposition to power. Capacitive and inductive reactants, they, capacitive in, inductance slows the, uh, uh, or delays the uh, voltage. Uh, inductive reactance slows the current. And together, they form capacitive reactive circuits or inductive reactive circuits. And when you have both, you have the makings of a tuning circuit. We'll learn more about this as we go along in this class. But when we're talking about impedance, we're talking about whatever you've got has so much resistive, pure resistive value in ohms. Capacitive reactance is measured in ohms and inductive reactance is measured in ohms. Combined reactance and resistance, they form impedance. So when you have a 50 ohm wire or cable, well, the cable, uh, a coaxial cable, for example, it has a length to it. Whatever the length of the wire is, well, that even though it's straight and flat, that still has a magnetic field around itself that has an element of inductive reactance. And a DC circuit, its effect only applies at the instant of power up and the instant of power down. But in an AC circuit, as we're going to see after the next break, when I go through that, it has a dramatic effect. Now, I'm going to go back to the book for a minute, and we're going to look at the formulas, and then we're going to come back to this after the break. Okay, is this getting a little heavy, everybody? Well, I'm going to try to make it easier to understand. Some of what I'm giving you tonight is actually a little bit ahead of the game. It's a little bit of what's in the general class. They'll get this, by the way, tomorrow, just like you, believe it or not. But you don't have to know this in as great a detail as I'm going to make them learn it because it's not on the general test. But this helps you to understand the questions of the general, I mean, the technician test. So I'm going to share with you now in just a minute when I start back up uh, in about a minute. I'm going to share with you some uh, that picture again, slightly modified, and we're going to look at a, it in a whole different perspective. And I'll share right now. And here we go. All right, you may notice this is a very similar circuit, except there's one thing different. I have a an AC signal source here, and it's going through a capacitor and an inductor. I have a little antenna here. Well, it's not exactly correct. To begin with, there is a relationship between AC signals and um, reactants, and there's a formula for it. It's kind of complicated, but it's not that hard. In an inductor, the reactance is two times the frequency times the in inductance of the reactor in micro or in Henry's. In Henry's. Now, in a capacitor, the reactance is one over two pi frequency times the capacitance in farads. Remember I told you units of measure that the unit for a capacitor is a farad. The unit for an inductor, I think I told you, is a Henry. If you notice something, both of them are dependent upon frequency. So 
there are a couple things which I'm going to define for you about radio electronics. In an AC circuit, which is what all radio waves are, when you generate the wave, <clears throat> that wave is going positive and negative. Now, when it first is positive, it charges this capacitor fully charged. And then this is positive. This is negative when it reaches the peak. Now it starts to drop off. Some of these electrons start to flow back the opposite way with it. But it takes time for that to catch up. But the current's been moving right along. I know it's a tough concept, but it is. It's what happens. So what we have is we have a condition we call out of phase. The voltage in this case is lagging behind the current 90 degrees out of phase. In other words, if we were looking at the wave, we had this wave and I'm going to try to draw you one. Just going to give you a quick line here. And have a nice, pretty wave. If this is our wave of the voltage, I'm sorry. If this is a wave of our current, let me correct it. It's going to start off right away, going right on its way, Mary, towards the antenna. But There we go. Unfortunately, 90 degrees later, or half of a wavelength, then our then our uh, uh, voltage will start to flow. Eh, let's pick a better color. Something we can see. There we go. The differential is phase. And if you average the voltage times the current here, you don't get the full value. The reason is that when this current, when the voltage, I'm sorry, when the current is maximum, the voltage is zero. When the voltage is maximum, whether it's plus or minus, the current is zero. And in between time, they don't line up. Now it's actually there, it's locked up in what we call out of phase. It's a difficult concept to grab. In an inductor, it's the opposite way around. Now we make the, the voltage the blue. It instantaneously starts up, but the magnetic field prevents the flow of electrons from moving for an instant. And then, depending on the frequency, 90 degrees out of phase or half of a, a, a quarter of a wavelength later, then the current flows through. And when they flip back and forth, this goes back and forth with it. From the positive through the negative, through the positive and the negative, they're out of phase. So this is what a capacitor or an inductor does to a wave. And how we use it in radio is very, very important. It's so important that it is the most fundamental aspect of radio. It so happens, as I said, when we have a reactance of a uh, inductor, and let's just say for, for the sake of, uh, of mankind, that this, oh, that didn't give me a color. Let's give myself a color. Let's say this is five ohms, 
of reactants. Now, whatever frequency I'm at, that means two times pi times the frequency times five ohms is going to give me, I'm sorry, times the, basically the magnetic strength of the coil, which we measure in Henry's, that's going to give us five ohms. And if this were, say, five ohms, Why, when that happens, these two signals would be back in line in this circuit. Why? Because this one pulls the current ahead 90 degrees. This one pulls the voltage back ahead 90 degrees. And if they were equal in value, they're back in sync. Now, when this happens, we have a phenomenon we call resonance. The X sub C, the capacitive reactants, and the X sub L are equal. They nullify each other, and the circuit is pure resistance. If you have an antenna that is at resonance, the X sub C, the X sub L, balance each other out, and hopefully you don't have a lot of resistance, just wire in the antenna, and you got a signal going out. But when you have a condition like this, where the signal is not in balance, why then you're not going to get the full signal out. And we're going to learn a little later on what this actually does to our radio signal. But this whole process is a process of impedance. The total resistance and reactance of a circuit. Oh, well, let's say that our resistor here is 0 0.01 ohm. My ohms, I'm never going to get approval from my former Greek uh, teacher. But let's say this is 1 ohm. Because these two cancel each other out, the total, the total impedance of this circuit is one ohm. But if this was, oh, let's say 55, then we're going to have 50 plus one, 50, one ohms of impedance. Our radios are designed to be around 52 ohms of impedance, give or take a hair. And we have circuits that we design to make them do that because we design or they chose upon coax that's designed at 50 ohms. In a coax, you have a length of wire that's the that establishes a magnetic field. That's the coil component. Everything has reactants. Everything has capacitance, but if you look at the end of a coax, you will find that you've got a uh, you got an outer conductor and an inner conductor. And when you have that outer and inner conductor, what you've got are two plates that, pre that presents a capacitance. And that's why coaxial cables are rated in ohms because they are designed to have 52 ohms, 50 to 52 ohms of impedance. The resistance is negligible. But the capacitive in inductance, I'm sorry, capacitive reactance and the inductive reactance together present 50 ohms. Majority of it is capacitance. And so if we know the, the uh, capacitive reactance 
is 50 is nearly 50 ohms, then we need the output of our transmitter to also have, I'm sorry, let's make this one 50 ohms. Let's take a uh, eraser, make this easier to understand. Let's make this 50. Yeah, we'll make that 50. 55 ohms. If we know that the that our um, antenna circuit or, or our coaxial cable is roughly 50 ohms, well, then we've got to have 50 ohms of coil or inductance on this side in the transmitter so that our signals will align again. And when we do that, they will both be on the same wave. They will be at residence. The further away from this we get, the less effective this works. When we get to antennas, we're going to learn how we make antennas at resonance. It also will involve waves. Okay? So, the formula for impedance is reactance plus resistance. And reactance is capacitive reactance and inductive reactance. I'm going to stop this share and go back to the book. Before I do, I'm going to ask at this point, is there anyone that wants me to go back over this? Because this is tough stuff to catch. Okay. So let me uh, share screen. We'll go back to the book. Where did the book go? This is the story of my life. Here we go. So, as I said, when the capacitive reactants and the uh, inductive reactants are the same, you are at resonance and the waves are aligned again. Now, when a part of the waves going out, I want to get to the back of this chapter. There's a circuit in the diagram here, which I want to cover. This is an antenna tuner. And what is happening here is there is a couple of capacitors and an inductor. Remember I told you that for the most part, the uh, 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 coax, is capacitive reactance. The antenna, though, might be inductive reactance. Depends on your antenna design. A loop antenna will have a, quite a bit of inductance because it's a loop. Not a tremendous amount, but it will have some. What an antenna tuner does, it provides a circuit so that we can change some capacitance this one happens to have two capacitors, one on the antenna side, one on the uh, transmitter side. And if we change inductance, um, no, normally these are either variable or just a switch, switches of different uh, portions. Why well, then we can make whatever this antenna impedance actually is look like it's a 50 ohm antenna and feed line to the transmitter. Local tra or radio transmitters, modern ones, will not transmit full power. Sometimes they won't transmit much of any power unless you have a load that's pretty close to 50 ohms. This was an agreed upon decision a half a century, almost a century ago. It didn't have to be 50 ohms. It was the one that was selected for transmitters. There were a lot of physics reasons for that, and it works. And we're stuck with it because nobody makes transmitters that aren't 50 ohm output. 
That is how an antenna tuner works. You guys will soon uh, see people use antenna tuners or have them. Important thing to note, the antenna tuner does not make that antenna work perfectly on the frequency that you tuned it to. It just makes it work somewhat. It makes it work pretty good by aligning the signal out, but it sacrifices some efficiency to do it. Now, it is uh, 8.50 my time. I'm going to come back at 9 o'clock, and I'm going to take questions on everything. Any questions? Is there anyone uh, out there, you guys, that are already very familiar with uh, this portion of electronics? I've dealt with some of it before, so I have a basic knowledge, but you're clearing up some things that I didn't understand, so that's great. Uh, same here. I grew up in an avionics shop, a uh, repair shop, and so... I kind of knew some of it, but it's been 40 years. So, well, I appreciate I'm the tell refresher. You guys something. I bring this up because I, I've seen it so often. I'll tell you what, let me, uh, let me generate a new drawing before we go to break. Let's, let's cover this. Okay. I'm going to generate a new drawing by opening up uh, another um, uh, paint version. Okay, and I'm gonna share it with you. There it is. We're gonna do this together. There's a guy out there, and I've probably told you about it. He sells an antenna, nifty thing. And he tells you this antenna will work on every band. But in order to make it work on that band, he gives you a particular type of coax. And that coax has to be 125 feet long, and then every band will tune. As long as you use this 125 feet of coax, you'll always have a perfect match. And sure enough, if you put a meter on it and you check for match, it'll show a 50, ma 50 ohm match. Well, the particular coax he has has an imp has an imp is a I'm sorry has a resistance, and that resistance all coax have resistance. That resistance happens to be about a half a ohm per foot. Not quite. A little under a half a ohm per foot. In fact, if you want it precisely, I can calculate it for you. Let's see. Come on. Calculator? That's not a calculator. Hang on, guys. I know you can't see this, but I'm going to do this for you really quick. There it is. To calculate that is real simple, 125 feet, and it happens to be 50 ohms at that point. It's a 2.5 ohm per foot cable. Now, if you only use this cable for short couplings, say a foot or two, that's not significant. But if you have 125 feet of it, its resistance is 50 ohms. And that's a problem. I don't know how to make the Greek symbols anymore. So I'll just draw it. I used to actually have my keyboard set up in Greek. And I uh, haven't done that in a long time. Well, it's 50 ohms of resistance. Well, to the radio, that looks like 
you've got 50 ohms of impedance because most of this circuit is resistance. The antenna and feed lines reactants play a minor role. So what you're doing is most of the energy is being radiated off by the wire as heat. But it will always show a perfect match. It will always show uh, to a meter, to a SWR meter, a standing wave meter. We're going to cover that in a little bit. It will always show that that is a perfect match. I am going to share the book again. And here we go. Now, fortunately, I keep moving stuff for my own edification. In the book, it tells you a capacitor uh, changes the current. Uh, changes in the current are a little ahead of or lead the voltage. I told you 90, 90 degrees, but it's actually a little less than 90 degrees to a fraction. So it's depending on the impedance, I'm sorry, the reactance, the capacitor will make it change up to nearly 90 degrees. There's some inefficiency, it makes 90 degrees impossible. But it is easy to think of as 90 degrees is the max. And uh, we measure or we uh, signify inductance. Uh, I'm sorry, reactance, not inductance. Reactance, whether it's uh, inductive reactance from a coil or capacitive reactance with a capital letter X. If it's X with a small sub C, that is capacitive reactance. If it's X with a uh, when I say small, I don't mean small letter. I mean smaller and down below a sub L, then that is inductive reactance. C is the symbol for capacitance. L is the symbol for inductor or coil. Okay. And the book uh, tells you what I basically told you before. Just a minute ago. Why am I drawing? Somehow I turned it on drawing. I didn't mean to do that. Here we go. All right. And I told you the combination of resistance and reactance is called impedance. Impedance is written as a symbol Z. Resistance. And reactants, reactants, whether capacitive reactants or inductive reactants, they're all measured in ohms. And impedance is measured in ohms. So the simple formula is impedance, which is Z, is equal to R resistance plus X sub C plus X sub L. X sub C and X sub L are, one, uh, are opposite in value to each other. So um, I don't know how they write it out for you, but uh, I'll look that up for next class. We'll get into that later. All right. We will be covering this more in detail in the future. Now, I'm going to talk about a couple of other things. In radio electronics today, we mostly use semiconductors. We used to use tubes a lot. Semiconductors are unique type of materials. They are a property of materials that both like to act like conductors or act like insulators, and they can be manipulated to do certain things. We can add impurities to them. They're generally things like silicon. We can add impurities to make them want to pass or create electrons or to accept electrons. They can either be N-type materials or P-type. And if we layer them together, 
we can make uh, substrates that uh, uh, can be controlled to by voltage or current to allow the flow of electrons or stop the flow of electrons. So um, one example of this is a diode. The point at which the P, the positive material, the parts that want electrons, the material that's been doped to allow for positive charges, and the next layer next to it, they're butted up to each other. The point at which they meet is called the junction. It's the P and positive negative junction. In a diode, you only have one junction. And when, if electrons hit the negative side, that side wants to give off electrons, doesn't want to accept anymore. But nothing flows. But if, in fact, if you look at this drawing, if you imagine that if we have electrons going this way, if it hits a layer, or if you look at these the letters PN junction, if you uh, imagine that if it's coming to a layer that's P, well, that will draw it in and it will pass right on by because this is a part that wants to push that electron out. So through a PN junction diode, which is most diodes today, electrons will only flow in one direction. When you come this way, you already got a negative and it says, no, I already got enough electrons. This side says, I want more and they go flying right across. This is how a diode works. And a diode will only allow electrons to flow in one direction. Now, if we have another layer and I don't think they have one. It's looking for a drawing. So let's make one. Let's have a little fun with this. I will uh, unshare this. And I will create a new file for us. Oh, let's take this one. Hang on, guys. I'll be right with you. All right, so I'm going to share that. Share screen. Yeah, that's not what I want to share. Let's stop that share. Share screen. There we go. Now, these are pretty simple things to understand once we get to it. So imagine, if you will, we're going to start with a simple diode, which I just discussed. You have a layer, and we're going to call this layer the positive, the P layer. And you have another layer, uh, let's make that one green. That's the negative layer. So to make this more confusing, allow me to put a oh something about this big. Let's put a positive in there. Oh, I think I'd like that in white. That didn't work. Let's go plus. And let's space a little ways and go minus. All right, this is a basic diode. And in a diode's design, we got a, a feed line coming in. Uh, we got power or a connection. It's just a wire. And we got a wire, oops, 
didn't want to do that. And we have a wire going out. I'm sticking with this drawing, guys. Not the best in the world. So, like I said, if we've got electrons, we're going to make our own little electron here. And like charges attract or repel, I mean, unlike charges repel. If this electron comes here, this pulls it. It pulls it across because it's positive charge. Momentum carries it, carries it across the barrier. And it flows around. And if the circuit's complete, it flows through. But if we come here, it meets a like charge that doesn't want to go anywhere. This is how a diode works. Pretty simple to understand. Now, I'm going to... Um, save our friendly little electron. I'll uh, get rid of them for a minute. Now, imagine, if you will, that we add another layer. It's going to get a little hard to understand, but trust me on this. The materials are made of slightly different materials, but uh, the... Uh, and this layer is another positive layer. Okay. And now we add another wire. An interesting thing happens here. Uh, this should have a plus, but I'm not going to bother to label it. I make another little electron. Now, electron comes here. Hey, it's positive. But guess what? Because there's a double barrier here, it can't go across. It's trying. It, so, if I... If I give another positive, if I give another, uh, if I put another charge on this side, it creates enough energy for both of them to flow around. One will flow significantly more than the other because of the way it's designed. This is not exactly 100%. How an electron or how a transistor works, but it's an easy concept. How a transistor, I mean, works. When there's voltage or charge, actually current flowing one way, it will flow the other. So, what's important about this? Well, this it can act as a switch. When I present charge here, we can have a light turn on. Or if I have a higher voltage on this side, I can put just a little bit of voltage here. We get a larger amount of that voltage coming through here. If I put more voltage here, even more of this will come through. Well, actually, more current, more energy. We call this process amplification. And this is the way we make radio amplification. Whether we use a transistor or a diode, I'm sorry, or a vacuum tube, the principle is still the same. In a vacuum tube, instead of charged areas, what we have are plates that draw the electrons across a vacuum. In a transistor, we have dope materials that will allow them only to flow a certain way. And by biasing or presenting a level of charge or motion, we will in, we will draw the flow of from one side 
through from the other. So one side basically turns it on or decides the level of which this one will flow through. So if this were like a, a five volt signal and we had a hundred volts on this side, when we absolutely had a full five volts going through here, we'd have the full hundred volts going through here. If we had two volts going through here, we'd have half, not necessarily exact, but some value like half going through. This is how amplification works. Amplifiers, I think you'll understand, are a critical part of radio, and this is how a transistor works. Now I'm gonna stop this share and go back to your book. It's here. Quick question. Yes, sir. So you're describing voltage flow through the, uh, the transistor or the amplifier, if you will. Yeah, Why are transistor? It's actually current that flows. In a uh, SCR, it's voltage. In a tube, it's actually voltage. But it's actually current that flows through, and the charge draws it across. Okay. okay. So, so my question is, why are most amplifiers rated in watts, which is a measure of of power. of power? Okay. How much work it can do? Okay. What is voltage times current? Okay. Very good. Thank you. It's power. And it really, we don't really care how many volts we actually put through or how much current we put through. We care about how much wattage, how much work we can make it perform, okay? Now, in the back of your book, I'm going to jump ahead. In the back of your chapter, I'm sorry. There are symbols for transistors. There is a P-style transistor and a, let me blow this up. There's a P-style, a PNP-style transistor, which I drew here. And there is an NPN-style resistor. The difference being that instead of the uh, positive, uh, negative, positive, we have a neg we have a negative, positive, negative. And one will energize with a positive charge and allow current to flow. One will energize with a positive charge and allow current to flow. One with a negative charge, I think. I don't know if I said that right, but you get, I think you got the idea. You also note that there are um, uh, FETs in here and other devices. One of them is a uh, MOSFET. They actually work a little differently. They will all they're they're similar to transistors, except it isn't the current flow that makes them work. It is the uh, voltage. On the gate, on a, on a, uh, on a, uh, 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 God darn it, a uh, junction transistor, the gate has a certain voltage. Once you get past that voltage, it starts to conduct. And as you go up, it conducts generally linearly to a certain point is a range, a voltage range. And it will allow current to flow around from the source to, to load and back around when the gate is energized. When current flows through a transistor, whether it's positively charged, biased or negatively, depending on the transistor, why well, then current will flow through the uh, from the collector to the emitter. And that's basically how amplification occurs. It can also be utilized to flow um, from the um, base to the emitter. Um, it depends on the circuit. I, I don't go into it this in depth for this class, but we will. Told you to learn these things. This is why. Types of diodes I want to cover right now, a very important one. So you should know. Standard diode looks like this. It's used for rectifying, for taking an AC signal and only allowing the DC part to pass through. 
It only allows one half of a wave to go through. So if you want to, uh, if you only use one diode in a circuit, it's a half wave rectifier. Only the top half or the bottom half of the wave passes through, depending on how it's positioned in the circuit. This circuit is a full wave rectifier. It is the equivalent of this little box down here, which indicates that it's not at separate diodes, but an individual uh, package of a rectifier block. And the way that it works is if an AC signal comes in, well, the positive component goes that way, the negative component goes that way, um, and vice versa if it's the other way around so that you always get both the positive and negative components. We'll cover that a little bit, but it's not important to know specifically, but we will, it's in your book. It's uh, not hard, if you have questions on it, I'll answer them in greater detail. Another diode I want you to be familiar with is a diode called a Zener diode. Zener diodes go into the circuit essentially backwards. They're wired in, so that the negative is on the positive side and the positive is on the negative side. What a Zener diode has a unique property where when they're reverse biased and they have the proper resistance, we cover this in greater detail in a, in a general class, they output a constant voltage. They are used for voltage regulation. Zener diodes are rated up by the voltage of which they operate. The last one here is called a Schocke diode. Schocke was a physicist and a researcher in the 1950s, developed this diode. Schocke diodes are super fast switching diodes. They will let very, very fast frequencies go through them. And guess where we need really, really fast frequencies sometimes? Of course, in radio frequencies. So um, it is 927. I got one thing I want to cover, and then we're going to be done tonight. In this book, in this chapter, it talks about fuses. I want you guys, fuses and circuit breakers, I want you to know two things. One, fuses are superior to circuit breakers. I won't ever change in stating this. The way a circuit breaker works is there's a bimetal type of device, two types of metal. One heats greater than the other. And when it does, it causes a spring locked in device to pop or open up. So one metal device has to expand greater than the other faster. When it gets too hot, that's what's supposed to happen. It usually does. And then the latching mechanism releases because it's not aligned properly. Unfortunately, circuit breakers can and do fail. Why do we use them? They're convenient and you can reset them. You don't have to buy a new one. Fuses, on the other hand, are a piece of metal cut to a certain size. And it's been calculated out that if more than a certain amount of current passes through them, they'll overheat and they will melt. They will almost always melt open. And that's their goal is to melt open, burn up and protect the circuitry. Generally speaking, fuses and, cir and circuit breakers aren't designed to protect you. They aren't designed to protect your radio. They're designed to protect the wires on your radio. Stupid as it sounds, they're wire protections, they're fire protection. So that too much heat will not build up and that power cord doesn't become a heating element like your stove and set your house on fire. There's a separate type of fuse called a slow blow fuse. And there are slow tripping circuit breakers. They're designed for things like motors. Remember in our discussion about uh, inductors, motors are huge inductors. And in the instant when the power first comes on, there is no, absolutely none. There's no magnetic field, no reactants until, until the current flows. I, I'm sorry, 
yeah, until the current flows. And then the magnetic field gets built up. And now you have reactants. In the first instant of starting a motor, it's a dead short on the electrical circuit. This is why when you start a vacuum cleaner, you first turn it on, the whole house lights can go dim. Generally speaking, a good example is motors can draw like a hundred, well, yeah, big ones can, a hundred times their rating in current for that first instant, even greater, it's almost infinite. But it's fractional, it's only for a super short time. So to prevent motor uh, fuses from blowing, they devised a slow blow fuse that will first, it's designed uh, so that it takes it a little extra long to get warm enough to pop. So if you have that instantaneous power through a motor, it doesn't pop right away. Slow reacting or delayed tripping uh, breakers do the same thing. And they will, like, they have a certain delay in how fast they will trip. So that heavy loads like a motor or something like, uh, well, motor is a good example. By the way, since we're talking about that, pay attention that a motor is a giant inductor. So when you use your motor at home and the electric company bills you at the end of the month, they bill you because their meters measure total uh, impedance. They don't actually measure voltage or, I'm sorry, resistance. They measure how much power you used. And the way that it works, it the metering circuit does not know that some of that power isn't really gone. You didn't really use it, it's just out of phase. And the power company knows this, but they don't change their bill to you. They have a complicated circuit at the other end at the powerhouse that when the power gets back there, they put it back in phase and that power is available for them to sell to the next user down the line. And yes, they overbill us all the time. Large industrial installations have their own phase correcting systems to fix this problem. Unfortunately, it's not economical for us. So we always overpay our electric bill, whether we like it or not. The last device I want to talk about is called a ground fault interrupter. It's a special type of fuse. And the reason what a ground fault protector is designed to do is to protect you. It's designed to protect against momentary transient uh, voltages. For example, dead shorts through you. It's designed to prevent you from getting electrocuted. If you have a ground fault circuit, there's a little test button on the breaker or on the plug or receptacle, I should say. And uh, that has a separate trip than the uh, circuit breaking trip. And its purpose is it as a circuit inside which detects the presence of a short to ground, even if it's a resistive short like through you, and instantly, in a fraction of a second, turns off the power to protect you. 